Hey everyone, so E3 is over and looking back, one of the biggest shocks was the announced pricing for Xbox One X coming in at $500 or £450. Now that's a hefty chunk of change for sure. Now in this video, I'm going to explain the reality of hardware pricing for cutting edge consumer electronics, why the box costs as much as it does and why we should be concerned about the price of the actual next generation of console hardware. So $500, well, we can actually rule out the possibility of Microsoft blatantly profiteering here. Head of Xbox Phil Spencer in an E3 interview actually seemed to be suggesting that they lose money on each box they produce, but break even in the short term through the games you'll buy for the system, and yes, the inevitable Xbox Live subscription. So I believe they're not actually ripping you off, <laughs> you're paying for what you get. So let's break that down. Now, to begin with, let's treat PlayStation 4 Pro's $399 as the baseline. When all said and done, this system still has a lot in common with Xbox One X, and the extra price is all about the add-ons. Firstly, the Scorpio engine. It's the most expensive single part of the system, and the cost of the chip is usually dictated by its size. Now, in this case, I reckon the processor is possibly 15 to 20% larger than PS4 Pro's processor. So that's what's required to deliver six teraflops and integrating the 384-bit memory interface. So the most expensive component, well, that's already significantly more costly. Next up, the memory. There's an extra 4 gigs of GDDR5 in there compared to the Pro. Back in the day when AMD upgraded the Hawaii cards from 4 gigs to 8 gigs with the 390 series, AMD told me that this bump set them back around $30 per card. Maybe prices have dropped a bit since then, but we're still looking at a big increase on a baseline console price. Then there's the hard drive. It's faster than the standard drives in the older consoles. Now the hard drive bandwidth on Xbox One is, I'm reliably informed, 40 megabytes per second, and this increases to 60 megabytes per second for the new console. Now Microsoft won't tell me how they've done this, but a move to a 7200 RPM unit is a possibility. Bottom line though, yep, this is more money on top of the baseline Pro price. Then we have the UHD Blu-ray drive. Now by my understanding, this isn't a huge price upgrade and we can tell that based on some of the deals we've seen for Xbox One S. I mean, that's a pretty cheap console with the UHD drive. But yeah, it's still gonna add a few dollars to the bill of materials. I mean, the list of additional costs just goes on. And on, PS4 Pro's using a fairly conventional cooling system for the processor. In pushing GPU frequencies up so high, Microsoft has to be creative. So yeah, that vapor chamber thermal solution in the new console, you can be sure that it costs quite a bit more. We can't quantify that cost, but consider this. Nvidia's reference GTX 1080 and 1080 Ti do have a vapor chamber, but the GTX 1070 doesn't. Yup, the vapor chamber was deemed too expensive for a $400 graphics card. So that is just the cost of the parts alone, and we need to consider the new level of engineering quality seen in Xbox One X with the Hovis method, where individual Scorpio engines are matched on a power level to individual motherboards. Well, I think it's safe to say that overall, you're getting a ton of extra technology for your extra $100. Now, that explains the price point. And to be fair, when I revealed the Scorpio hardware specs a few months back in my opinion piece for Eurogamer, I was pretty clear that $500 was the most obvious price point for what is a console design on the absolute cutting edge. But as I said at the beginning of the video, it's not the Xbox One X price point you really should be concerned about. It's the fact that the pace of technological progress is slowing down. And on top of that, it means that relatively speaking, that technology is holding its price for longer. So consider this. When Xbox One X launches, it would have been four years since the launch of PS4 and the standard Xbox One. Back in the day, before 360 and PS3, a console would last about five years before being replaced. Now I'm going to stack up PS4 against the X here, 2013's most powerful console against its 2017 equivalent. CPU power has only gone up 43%, memory capacity has gone up by 50%, and the biggest boost is GPU. Uh, now roughly speaking, we get around an extra 220% there. Now that's great for a console designed as a mid-generation refresh aimed at 4K resolution, but let's not forget, four years on, we're still paying $100 more than the launch cost of the PlayStation 4. 
and it's not really a generational leap. In fact, compared to the jump from, say, PS2 to PS3, it's small beans. So to illustrate, here's Gran Turismo compared between PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 3. The same content, the same cars, same tracks. We're getting almost five times the rendering resolution in the bump between generations, which is more than the leap from 1080p to 4K. And on top of that, we're getting massively improved fidelity in all areas of the presentation. Geometry, textures, effects, not to mention a huge improvement in the quality of the actual simulation, the gameplay. This, my friends, is what a generational leap is all about. There were reports recently that Sony might be considering a PS5 release in 2018. And yes, prospectively, such a machine could be more powerful than Xbox One X, but not dramatically so. Mark Cerny floated the idea of an 8 teraflop GPU as a requirement for true 4K gaming, and that's kind of viable for a 2018 console. And yes, we could get a mobile version of Ryzen in there, and possibly 16 gigs of RAM. But the point is that technology isn't progressing fast enough, and prices aren't dropping quickly enough to make this viable for console level pricing. I reckon the absolute best case scenario there is, yes, you guessed it, another $500 console. That price that so many users just aren't happy with. So what should we expect from a prospective next-gen console that actually provides a big upgrade? First of all, we're going to need to move to a new processor fabrication node. The chips in Pro and Xbox One X use 16 nanometer FinFET technology. By looking at AMD's roadmap for its desktop APUs, which leaked recently, well, assuming the leak is true, we can see that a switch to a new process technology doesn't happen until 2019, where we shall have Ryzen Plus cores and the next-gen Navi GPU architecture. Smaller process node means more transistors on the chip, meaning a big leap in graphics power and room to integrate Ryzen CPU technology in a console-sized box, and prices should come down at that point. But even in 2019, the cost of memory, especially fast memory and higher performance storage, well, it's still not going to be cheap. Genuinely, with PS4 still selling so well and with Pro as an option, I expect to see this console generation drawn out just as long as the last one was, and possibly longer. And this is why Microsoft thinks that the way forward is more regular console refreshes. For Sony though, when I spoke to Mark Cerny on the topic, he still believes firmly in the traditional console generation. Now from my perspective, both approaches have merits, but what I will say about what Sony told me? Well, new generation tech is like pressing a giant reset button on the way games are made. It's a profound shift towards higher, better standards and more impressive graphics and gameplay. Sets a new baseline, if you like. So yeah, going forward, it will be interesting to see just when we consider this generation to have reached its conclusion. But the bottom line is this, if it comes in the next year or two, well, we're going to be paying a lot more than we might like for the privilege of new console hardware. And I think that's where I'm gonna leave it for now. Well, I hope you found this video useful. Please do like and subscribe for more and follow us on Twitter for more updates. And yes, if you want to see all of our videos the way they were meant to be seen, please consider supporting the Digital Foundry Patreon. For 4K gameplay video in particular, the quality is on another level, so do check out the free sample there. But for now, for me, thanks for watching.